Good morning. We have general questions. Question number one, Ken McIntosh. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what impact it considers reduced opening times at police stations such as Giffnick will have on residents' feeling of safety and security. Cabinet Secretary, Ken McCaskill. Policing in Scotland is performing excellently. Latest crime statistics show that crime is at a 39-year low. There are a 1,000 more police officers on our streets compared to 2007, and confidence and satisfaction in the police is high. The Scottish Government share with Police Scotland the top priority to keep people safe across all communities in Scotland. Operational policing is a matter for Police Scotland, and operational policing will continue to be delivered from local stations. The impact is on the provision of front counter services, which are rarely used. The review of public counter provision aims to help deliver a more consistent, professional service to the public and enable more officers to be deployed in our communities where and when they are needed the most. Ken McIntosh. Uh, thank you. Does the Minister recognise that, first of all, losing the local courts in Giffnick, then losing the ability to phone the local police station directly in Giffnick, and now severely cutting back uh, the opening hours, will do nothing to reassure residents other than that their service has been reduced? Cabinet Secretary. It's a factual situation regarding Giffnick Police Station. The public counter is currently open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The proposal is for it to be open 7 a.m. until midnight, seven days a week. So it will close between midnight and 7 a.m. This is after a Police Scotland review showed that over a nine-day period there were a total of 162 visits to the public counter by members of the public in Giffnick. This averaged approximately 18 people per day. Data analysis throughout the day highlights the fact that the public demand is minimal after midnight, when treble nine, one o one, and access to a police, station, a police officer is available, I think Mr. McIntosh should look at the factual evidence and recognise that this is a reasonable proposal to maintain that visible police presence, delivering an outstanding service to our communities, whether in Giffnock or elsewhere. Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Does the Cabinet Secretary recall my reference in a recent debate on this proposal of counters to the established use of diary cars in, for example, Midlothian? That is, police taking those 101 non emergency calls and then fixing an appointment at a time and place suitable to the caller to take the statement. Can he advise if this is happening in other parts of Scotland? It seems to me a very good idea. Cabinet Secretary. Well, it is a matter for Police Scotland, but I have just come from an international policing conference and the Chief Constable was speaking and was mentioning matters such as diary cars, which I do believe provide a convenient option which allows members of the public to arrange an appointment with officers at their own home at a time of their suiting uh, and convenient to the police. It ties in with other use of social media, telephone and other aspects. There are issues about whether it's practical in some rural areas because of the size of the communities, but certainly in many areas it will provide, I think, an option that will be greatly appreciated by members of the public and an improvement and enhancement on the current excellent service. Question number two, Claire Baker. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Minister for Environment and Climate Change has had with the Minister for Housing and Welfare regarding the environmental benefits of measures to tackle fuel poverty. Minister Paul Wheelhouse. I, I regularly hold meetings with my ministerial colleagues to discuss portfolio contributions to meeting our world-leading climate change targets, and these have provided opportunities for constructive and productive discussions. I had, in fact, a scheduled meeting with the Minister for Housing and Welfare this morning. Uh, our conversation included a focus on the multiple benefits that are being delivered by our energy efficiency programmes, which directly impact on tackling the scourge of fuel poverty, as well as making a significant contribution to reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Clear Baker. Uh, while measures such as Shine on Fife and the Green Deal are welcome, they don't suit every household or type of property. And speaking to local energy action groups, the frustration is that there's a lack of funding for smaller measures such as energy efficient light bulbs or draft excluders or chimney balloons. Uh, measures that don't cost much, but for low income households, those measures can be beyond their means. Will the Minister consider giving greater flexibility in the use of the Climate Change Fund so that people in need can access small measures which can make a big difference? Minister. Well, the, in terms of the Climate Challenge Fund, I, I certainly uh, understand that, uh, the point that Claire Baker is making. We're doing a lot of good work through organisations like eco-congregations 
and indeed through uh, individual communities to ensure they have uh, projects which are, are supporting people in understanding what energy efficiency measures can help them uh, with their domestic properties. But certainly if there are any proposals that she wants to bring forward about use of other technologies and, and uh, LED light bulbs and so forth, I would be interested to look at them, but certainly happy to discuss the matter with the member. Jimmy McGregor. Um, how can the, the government target, uh, how can it target its fuel poverty measures on the most hard to reach groups such as the very elderly who live alone in remote rural areas? Minister. Well, I mean, clearly the, 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 the absolute delivery of this is a matter for the Housing Minister, Margaret Burgess, but in terms of trying to help the member with the, the question, clearly we are aware that as we get into more hard-to-treat properties, this is becoming more of an issue and a, a bigger challenge, as I'm sure the member knows, in a rural area like the Highlands and Islands. Uh, the government is committed to making available a total funding, including money from energy companies, of up to £200 million a year, uh, and that's so hence the resource is there in line with what the EET committee asked for in terms of investment in energy efficiency measures. But we are getting into more difficult to treat properties and that is the focus of what my colleague Margaret Burgess and her team are looking at is how we make sure that we can implement uh, measures in that, in that scale in properties that are hard to treat such as solid wall uh, properties in rural areas. Question three, Angus MacDonald. The Scottish Government, what training and advice the Scottish Prison Service gives staff regarding pensions, entitlement and contributions? Cabinet Secretary Ken McCaskill. The civil service pension schemes are a reserve matter and the responsibility of the UK Cabinet Office. All new Scottish prison service staff receive a pension starter pack which advises on the options available to them, including pension entitlement and contributions. As part of their initial training, new recruit prison officers attend a session on pensions at SPS College. All SPS staff who are members of a civil service pension scheme are advised on an annual basis of their pension entitlements with an explanation of how they are calculated. In addition, SPS staff are advised of any changes made by the UK Government to their pensions through internal staff notices. Angus MacDonald. I thank the Justice Secretary for his reply. I have received an inquiry from serving prison officers in my constituency who have highlighted to me their frustration at not being given proper information following changes to their pensions, despite assurances that information, uh, inform information sessions would be rolled out to prison establishments. As, there don't seem to be, uh, as, that, as these don't seem to be on the SPS agenda, will the Justice Secretary, despite it being reserved, undertake to ensure a programme is rolled out in the very near future, advising SPS staff in all prison establishments? Cabinet Secretary. Oh, thank you. Well, I understand the member's concerns, and I think he's appropriate to raise it. I'm aware of the anger and frustration uh, that the Prison Officers Association have with regard to the uh, proposal and the implementation of the coalition government's fact that prison officers will now require to work to the age of 68, whether in Balliny, Conton Vale or Polmont. Uh, I find that frankly ridiculous. But as I've said, pensions are reserved. However, the Chief Executive of the Scottish Prison Service, Colin McConnell, has confirmed that SPS staff receive information about their pension from My Civil Service Pension Limited at My CSP, who are a private sector company which administers the civil service pension schemes on behalf of the Cabinet Office. SPS has staff within their HR department with sufficient pensions knowledge to provide pensions awareness sessions to new recruits and assist existing staff with pension inquiries through liaison with my CSP. In addition to the pension sessions to new recruit uh, prison officers that are already being delivered, SPS is committed to providing additional awareness raising sessions ahead of the introduction in 2015 of the new civil service pension scheme uh, work to design SPS approach is at a very early stage. I would be happy to discuss this matter further with the member and I can give him an assurance that the SPS are happy to discuss both with his individual constituent himself or indeed the POA. Sadly, some of the most uh, harmful matters are forced upon us and upon them because of the proposals of the coalition government. Question number four, Jim Hume. To ask the Scottish Government what progress the, the Detect Cancer Early Programme has made. Cabinet Secretary Alex Neil. Presiding Officer, we know the earlier a cancer is diagnosed, the easier it is to treat, and that's why the £30 million Detect Cancer Early Programme aims to increase the proportion of Scots diagnosed in the earliest stages of cancer by 25%, initially focusing on breast, lung and colorectal cancers. To support this programme, we have launched four Detect Cancer Early social marketing campaigns. The initial evaluation of the social marketing campaigns run so far have been encouraging. However, it is too early to assess what impact this will have on early diagnosis. 
Capital and revenue has been made available to support an increase in diagnostic and treatment capacity. In addition, we've introduced a new two-year primary care initiative to support uptake of the National Bowel Screening Programme and Health Improvement Scotland are undertaking a refresh of the Scottish referral guidelines for suspected cancer. Jim Hume. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for, for his answer, but the fact remains, of course, that of 10 cancer types, unfortunately, the Scottish Government's only meeting the 62-day target in four of those. Uh, in some areas, such as Lanark Lanarkshire, uh, only 75% of cervical patient, uh, cancer patients are being treated on time, 60% for ovarian cancer in the Highlands. We have a, a, in Grampian a, one colorectal cancer patient waiting 128 days, a urological cancer patient 139 days, and a patient with melanoma 140 days. Does the Cabinet Sec Secretary agree it is unacceptable for some cancer patients to be waiting over twice the stated uh, wait for treatment, that the problems linked to increasing number of consultant vacancies, and will he commit to investigating the circumstances behind, behind why some boards are underperforming in certain cancer types and pledge to resolve this as soon as possible. Cabinet Secretary. Presenting officer, there are two cancer waiting time targets. One is the 31-day target and the other one is the 62-day target. In terms of overall the 31-day target, we are meeting that target and we have been consistently. In recent months, there has been a slight underperformance in the 62-day target. For example, one of the reasons for that is an acute shortage of particular types of oncology specialists, which is a shortage not just affecting Scotland, but affecting the entire United Kingdom. And the northern area, including Grampian in particular, has been adversely affected because of retirals and uh, people relocating by that particular shortage. We are addressing the situation as a matter of urgency because it's our intention to ensure that both the 31-day target and the 62-day target are met right across the country and, uh, ideally, in every relation to every one of the 10 cancers. Question 5, Elaine Murray. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the increase in crimes of violence and indecency in Dumfries and Galloway in the period April to September 2013, compared with the same period in 2012. Cabinet Secretary Ken McCaskill. Well, recorded crime in Dumfries and Galloway is at a 34-year low, having fallen 44% since 2006-07, supported by 1,000 extra officers in our communities provided by this government. The number of sexual offences has fallen from 150 in 2011-12 to 133 in 2012-13, a decrease of 11%. I am aware provisional management figures for Dumfries and Galloway show an increase in violent crimes, including two homicides, in the six-month period from April to September 2012-13. To put these figures into context, though, there were a total of 62 recorded homicides in Scotland in 2012-13, the lowest number since 1976, the first year for which comparable homicide records are available. Every homicide in Scotland is a tragedy. The Scottish Government continues to listen to and work with Police Scotland and other partners, including No Knives, Better Lives, Medics Against Violence, Mentors in Violence Prevention and local communities in its effort to tackle crime and violence. Ultimately, we want to make Scotland a safer place to live and work. Elaine Murray. Thank you, uh, Cabinet Secretary, for that uh, answer. However, since Police Scotland came into being, reported crimes of violence have risen by 25%, murders 200%, petty assaults by 30%, domestic abuse by 29%, dangerous driving by 55%, and crimes of indecency by 60%. You say that in Scotland, where our crime is at a 39-year low, is it a 39-year low in Dumfries and Galloway? Cabinet Secretary. I, I really wish that the member had gone as some of her colleagues uh, had to the International Policing Conference earlier today and heard from the Chief Constable, who was adamant and praiseworthy of the support and efforts being carried out by his members. We do have a 39-year low. We do have the lowest recorded homicide stat since 1976. We have seen a halving of youth crime. We have seen a reduction of knife handling offences of 60 per cent since 2006-07. There are difficulties. Every murder is a tragedy. Two murders in Dunfries and Galloway is unacceptable, and Police Scotland are acting. But I do think all members of this Parliament have an obligation and a duty to support an outstanding public service that is Police Scotland, not to talk it down when their record is impeccable and unimpeachable. Question 6, Liam MacArthur. 
Uh, thank you to ask the Scottish Government whether it has dropped plans to withdraw recognition from the Orkney Fish Producers Organisation. Cabinet Secretary Richard Lockhead. The Orkney Fish Producers Organisation does provide valuable support to the fishermen of Orkney and the Government supports the work it does to manage community quotas and encourage new skippers into fishing. There are a range of issues in which the Government is in dialogue with the organisation and we will continue to work with it during 2014 to develop ideas for how we can support the fishermen uh, and deliver uh, a number of initiatives locally. In the meantime, we will maintain the Government's recognition of the producer organisation as these discussions continue. Liam MacArthur. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that uh, response? And um, as he's acknowledged the, the valuable role that the Orkney PO does perform, but in his letter to me on the 9th of uh, September, uh, he does uh, confirm that uh, the, uh, he had advised that uh, formal recognition would be withdrawn by 31st of December 2013, a move that was strongly opposed by the PO, the, the local council, and others. To so be aware, the PO holds two community quotas, helping deliver government policy, assist new entrants into the uh, industry another key priority of the Minister uh, and the Government, and that new rules coming into play in January downplay the issue of size as a criteria for recognition, reflecting the fact that smaller groups are often more active on behalf of their members. Given all these factors, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to now lift the lingering threat hanging over the Orkney PO, or at the very least ensure that a formal decision to continue recognition of the PO can be taken as soon as possible after the new CMO rules uh, are put in place from January next year? Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I said, there are very constructive discussions taking place between the Scottish Government and the Orkney fishermen to ensure that valuable role is continued to be delivered uh, by that producer organisation. But it's important, of course, we have that dialogue with the producer organisation because we've got obligations to have uh, those issues uh, monitored, and that's why the discussions are very, very important. But as I say, we recognise the very valuable role it carries out, and we will maintain recognition. Question 7, Fiona MacLeod. To ask the Scottish Government what discussions the Cabinet Secretary for Finance, Employment and Sustainable Growth has had with the First Minister regarding the economic opportunities arising from his recent visit to China. Cabinet Secretary John Swinney. Mr. Officer, the First Minister has reported to Cabinet on the considerable economic benefits arising from his visit and the opportunities for the oil and gas and construction missions that he led to China. A showcase of innovative Sino-Scottish partnerships were announced in Beijing, which is set to be worth more than £40 million to Scotland over the next decade. These announcements included designers of the world's first unmanned offshore oil platforms, UPB, signing a memorandum of understanding with Offshore Oil Engineering Company Limited. Apple Green Homes announced a partnership with the Vanka Group, one of China's largest property developers, to develop a home of the future to showcase innovation and design from Scotland. And even the national game was involved, with the Scottish Professional Football League signing an agreement with Chinese partners PP Live TV to, see, to screen Scottish league matches in China to an audience of 60 million people. Fiona MacLeod. So with that impressive list, I presume that the Cabinet Secretary will agree with me that encouraging trade and investment links with China will be a boost to the Scottish economy. Cabinet Secretary. I think it is important that we establish the okay. connections between Scotland and um, external markets. Uh, we spend a great deal of time as a government ensuring that the international ambitions and objectives of the government's economic strategy are fulfilled. That involves ensuring that we motivate more and more companies in Scotland to participate in international business activity and trade. Um, that is an improving picture, and uh, I welcome the contribution that's been made by the visit that the First Minister made to China with the different delegations uh, to what that has contributed to the development of the Scottish economy. Question 8, Rod Campbell. To ask the Scottish Government what its response is to the report of the review of expenses and funding of civil litigation in Scotland. Minister Rosanna Cunningham. Uh, Sheriff Principal Taylor published his comprehensive uh, report on 11 September 2013. Uh, the report makes extensive recommendations on a whole range of proposals regarding expenses and civil litigation, uh, and the Government is considering the detail of the report will publish its intentions in due course. Briefly, Mr Campbell. I thank the Minister for her answer. What further consultation is the Scottish Government planning in relation to the proposal to introduce a qualified one-way cost shifting to apply to all personal injury claims being a departure from the traditional expenses follow success rule? Briefly, Minister. Uh, I, I appreciate the Member's interest in this. The uh, wide range of detailed recommendations are being looked at carefully by this Government. When decisions are made about which will be pursued, then appropriate further consultation will be undertaken. Uh, thank you. Uh, we